Anyway, we are glad that you're here. We'll have our services online tonight at 5 and 6. Uh, we're going to be looking at the uh, 13th chapter of the book of the Revelation. Talk about the beast out of the sea. It's uh, really a frightening scene and uh, a true scene. I think one that we need to warn people about. Uh, a scene that we don't have to see other than in the pages of scripture if we know the Lord, I believe. So I uh, hope you'll be able to join us tonight for that. And then at 5 o'clock, the children's message. Um, Brother Dale gave us our total for our Annie Armstrong Easter offering was $2,650. So that's a, a, a good offering to go to the uh, Home for North American Missions. In fact, I passed the state office this past week working storm trouble in um, Prattville. Uh, I didn't even know where it was at, and I drove by, and there it was. So anyway. That's part of what's funded by the North American Mission Board. All right, anybody else have an announcement? We will have, I know this is early maybe, but in three weeks, we'll have the Lord's Supper. It'll be the first Sunday in June. So uh, anyway, uh, that's, I ordered some more cups. Hopefully, as Eddie says, the styrofoam will be a little better in this group that I bought that's got the little wafer on the top. So anyway, uh, we'll try those uh, June the 1st. All right, anybody else an announcement? Well, I have one. We would like for all of our mothers, grandmothers, stepmothers, if you're a mother, would you rise, please? Foster mother. Yeah, two or three times. And we have uh, a little present for you that we'll talk about a little later. We're so, so appreciative of y'all, and we're going to talk about a mother and a grandmother in just a few minutes. So thank you very much, and I'll tell you more about your pants at the end of the song. We'll turn to number 386. God's word, and I'm going to shock you, and turn to the book of 2 Timothy. I didn't say Matthew. 
And we're going to look at, uh, as I said, a mother and a grandmother today. Um, we're going to talk about the mother of a man of God. Um, I hope that doesn't ruffle your feathers that I'm throwing a man in on Mother's Day, but uh, Billy Sunday uh, was a rough preacher of the 1800s, I guess in early 1900s. And uh, you didn't have any trouble understanding him. As my granddaddy used to say, he put the hay down where the cows could get to it. There was no misunderstanding him. He was used the language maybe a little crudely, but he spoke the truth. And he said people accused him of rubbing the fur the wrong way. And he said, I don't. He said, the cat's turned backwards. Let the cat turn around, and then he'll be going in the right direction. So anyway, we're going to talk about a mother today and a grandmother and their influence on this man, as you might have guessed, Timothy. The book of 1 Timothy, it seems like to me it hadn't been long ago. I didn't look to see, but we actually tried to preach through the books of 1 and 2 Timothy. Doesn't seem like long ago. It's probably been long ago, but anyway. I don't know if you remember me telling you this, but the book of 1 Timothy, Paul wrote to Timothy to tell him how the church is supposed to go. Paul had sent Timothy to Ephesus to be, we would say, the pastor of the church. Um, they were having trouble even during Paul's time, and then later in John's time when he wrote the book of the Revelation, they were theologically straight, but they were loveless, you remember. So Paul wrote 1 Timothy to Timothy to tell him how the church is supposed to be. Paul writes 2 Timothy, most scholars that I believe, um, believe that it was during the last days of his life, 2 Timothy, probably the last book that he wrote, and he is writing to encourage Timothy, to strengthen Timothy, to tell him what to do, and in some cases how to do it. Be strong, be courageous, study, preach the word. All of those come in 2 Timothy and some passages that you'll be familiar with. We're going to look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, and I'll just read, kind of get us a running start. I'll just start at the beginning. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers, with a pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers, night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Let's pray. Lord, we're grateful for this time, grateful for this day. We pray that you would glorify yourself through the teaching of your word. We pray, Lord, that we would lift up the name of Jesus, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. A mother of three notoriously unruly children was asked, if you had it to do all over again, would you have children again? Yes, she replied, but not the same three. 
And sometimes you feel like that as parents and mothers who put so much into their children. Paul is reminding Timothy in this final letter to be the person that God has called you to be. Timothy, I remember the things that you did, and I'm, call I'm calling on you to remember the things that you did so that you will keep doing them, even though most people believe that Paul wrote this while in a dungeon in prison, not during the house arrest that we think of that he wrote the what we call the prison epistles. But this was in a dungeon, uh, the Mambertine, I think it's called prison, just a hole in the ground, waiting to die. He tells Timothy at the end of this letter, Try to come here and see me. I want to see you again. Try to get here before winter. Bring my coat and bring the parchments. Paul's plea to him. But we want to focus on verse 5 today. Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Paul mentions Timothy's sincere faith, or the sincerity of Timothy's faith. Faith unfeigned, the King James says, without hypocrisy. <coughs> Timothy's faith was not according to Paul, was not one way at church and one way at work. One way at church, in our vernacular, that, dare we say, if our faith is one way in church and one way on 280. It was the same. It was without hypocrisy. It was without pretense. In 1 Timothy 1, Paul tells Timothy, now the end of the commandment is charity, is love, out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Timothy had proven to be that person. Paul calls him his son, 1 Timothy 1, 2. In the passage we read here, and uh, I believe it's verse 2. Yeah, verse 2 in 2 Timothy. Chapter 1 and verse 2. In 1 Corinthians 4, 17, he tells the church at Corinth that Timothy, I'm going to send Timothy, my beloved son. He's mentioned in the book of Acts as Paul's traveling companion. He's uh, mentioned by Paul in the letter to the Romans, the letters 1 and 2 Corinthians. Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, of course, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Philemon, and then whoever the writer of Hebrew mentions him in Hebrews. So Timothy had a sincere faith, and it was obvious. Secondly, I want us to see the source of his faith. And I guess I should say the human source of his faith. Faith is the gift of God. We don't just, we have a lot of songs that uh, kind of lead us to believe that. I was searching for the Lord. Uh, one of my granny's favorite songs, which is really unbiblical. Well, not unbiblical. You got to keep walking. Keep walking. Walking in the light of the Lord. And you do have to keep walking. I searched and I searched for the road that led to glory. I wondered if I'd ever find the way, which leads you to believe that we're out there searching for God. And we're not. It may seem that way to us, but he's out there searching for us. And were he not to call us and to draw us, we wouldn't come by ourselves. As Adrian Rogers used to say, a sinner doesn't get saved for the same reason a crook can't find the policeman. He's not looking for it. 
We're not looking for God on our own. We would wander away, and that's why Paul says in Ephesians 2, it's by grace that you're saved through faith. And that not of yourself, even the faith to believe is not of yourself. It's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. And we would boast about it if we thought it was ours, and some people do. Dr. Lee used to say we have a, a hell-bent society today that's so proud they can strut sitting down. Does that sound right? Timothy did have faith, and ultimately it's the gift of God. But it is often instilled in us by others. Paul says, I know about your sincere faith, and the source of that faith is your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. They taught the word of God. Some people believe that Timothy was saved, if you look through the book of Acts, that Timothy's conversion happened in first in Acts chapter 13. We don't see his name till Acts chapter 16. But in Acts chapter 16, Paul goes... Well, he goes to Antioch um, and Pisidia. This was not the Antioch in Syria where they sent him out, but the Antioch on into Turkey. And they went and preached, and the governor of the town got saved, whose name was Paul also. They went on a little farther, and they got to the Jews ran him out of town there because they didn't like the message he was preaching. People were being saved. They ran him out of town. They went on to Derby, preached there, healed people. So much so that the people thought they were the gods that had come down. They called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury. Then the Jews came from Antioch and stirred them up there so much that they drug Paul out of the city and stoned him, leaving him from dead, leaving him for dead. He either, some believe, he was actually killed, if that might have been the time in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where he talks about his vision of heaven, that may have come there. He either revived or resurrected, and either one is fine with me. He got up, went on to Lystra. Let me back up. He got stoned in Lystra. He went on to Derby, preached there, and came back through Lystra where they had stoned him. We don't know if Timothy saw that, the miracles that Paul had done, the courage that Paul had, the preaching that he did. But, according to Paul, the greatest testimony of faith was his believing mother and grandmother who taught him the word. Later in, well, this is one of the passages you'll recognize. And we read 2 Timothy 3. If I say that, your mind goes immediately probably to verse 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's breathed out by God. Let me read you what comes right before that. Timothy, continue in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God breathed is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul says, continue in what you've learned, knowing of whom you've learned them. Acts 16 tells us that Paul's, uh, Timothy's, mother was a Jew but his father was a Gentile and so his mother 
apparently was a believer and when Paul came and shared the message of Christ, she received him as Messiah and she taught this little one. Paul says, you've learned it from a child. That word is translated other places to speak of an unborn child. You remember when Mary went to see Elizabeth? When she had heard that she was going to have the Savior? She went to her cousin and told her, and Elizabeth said, I'm so glad you came. This not only tells me what happened to you, but it confirms what's happening to me. And when the baby I'm carrying heard your greeting, he leaped in my womb. That baby. Paul says you've learned from a child is the word used to describe Jesus Moments after he had been born, the shepherds came and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. In Luke 18, or um, yeah, in Luke 18, Luke says, when the people saw Jesus, they began bringing infants to him. It's the same word. Peter uses the word to say as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may be nourished thereby. Paul says, Timothy, you've been getting this for a long time. Since you, maybe, since before you were born, he had been getting a steady diet of God's word, which is able to make you wise unto salvation. Timothy was taught the word of God. But it's not enough to teach the word of God. As Vance Abner says, you can have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed and still misspell the word. It has to be lived out. And I believe Lois and Eunice lived it in front of Timothy. It's a story of two young boys that moved to a small town in Missouri. Their father was a well-known preacher. After a few days of moving into this town, they found a dog, just really kind of a mongrel, a black dog, and had some white streaks on his tail. And they asked their daddy if they could keep the dog. And he told them they could. A few days after that, another family came to the door and said, Hey, have you seen a dog around here? We had a black dog, had some white stripes on his tail. And the preacher daddy said, No. The boys heard the daddy talking at the door, went and got some black shoe polish and covered up the white streaks on the dog's tail, came back to the door, and the daddy said, see, our dog doesn't have any white streaks on his tail. This can't be your dog. And the people left. The dad kept the preacher, daddy, kept the dog, but lost the boys. The boys' names were Frank and Jesse, James from Missouri, who turned out to be some of the worst outlaws that there were. It's not enough to preach it. It's not enough to teach it. You have to live it out. There was a man named Robert Ingersoll. He was an attorney and an agnostic. I don't think those two necessarily go together, but uh, for the sake of some of our guests here, uh, but he was an attorney and an agnostic, and he went around speaking, telling, in basically my crude English, how stupid it was to be a Christian. He even wrote a book called Some Mistakes of Moses, and he would go around and lecture on this book talking about the mistakes of Moses. Vance Abner told the story of two people that went to hear him, or two people that were talking about Robert Ingersoll, and they said, 
I wouldn't walk across the street to hear Robert Ingersoll's talk on the mistakes of Moses, but I sure would love to hear Moses talk about the mistakes of Robert Ingersoll. <laughs> anyway, he was a lecturer, speaker. And in his heyday, two college students went to hear him lecture. And as they left after the lecture walking down the street, one of them said, well, I guess he knocked the props out from under Christianity, didn't he? The other one said, no, I don't think he did. Robert Ingersoll did not explain my mother's life. And until he can explain my mother's life, I will stand by my mother's God. Sincere faith has a source. It's the teaching of God's word and the living of God's word before you. And then finally, the steadfastness of Timothy's faith. Paul says... I remember the faith you had. I know the faith that your mother and grandmother had. And I'm convinced that you're going to have it too. To the end, the word has the idea of persuaded. Based on what's happened at this point in time, I'm sure it's going to continue. So Paul says, I'm persuaded that you will keep going. On Paul's second missionary journey in Acts 16, he comes back through Lystra. There was a certain disciple there, it says, named Timothy, a son of a certain woman which was a Jewish, a Jewess, and believed, and his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. He would... Him would Paul have to go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew that his father was a Greek. Paul desired Timothy to come with him and serve. He knew he could be counted on. He knew that he would persevere. There are many instances in the Bible of a mother's faith and the perseverance of their children. One that we talk about a lot on Mother's Day is Hannah. 1 Samuel chapter 1. Hannah was married to a man who had another wife. She was despised because she couldn't have a son. She went to the tabernacle to pray and she prayed so much that Eli, the high priest, thought she was drunk. Apparently, because of his two sons, he had seen drunk women at the tabernacle before. She said, I'm not drunk. I'm pouring my heart out to God that he would give me a child. And he did give her a child. And when he was weaned, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 1, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour, a bottle of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord of Shiloh. And the child was young. And they slew the bullock and they brought the child to Eli. And she said, O oh my Lord, as, my, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed. And the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Samuel, who could hear God speak when the high priest could. Samuel, who anointed both Saul and David. Samuel, who could call out Saul for his disobedience. Who could slay a king when he had to. 1 Samuel 15. Read that story about the Amalekites. The Saul spared the king and Samuel showed up. And the Bible says it 
that king, the king thought the danger had passed. And Samuel walked in there and said, where's the king at? And the Bible says Samuel pulled his sword out, and I like the way the King James says it, hewed him to pieces. He could call out Saul when he sinned. And the Bible tells us in 1 Samuel 25, when he died, all Israel mourned for him. Another mother we think about is Jochebed. In Exodus chapter 2, the Bible tells us there was a woman who conceived a child. And in that time, Pharaoh was destroying all the Israelite babies. The Hebrew or the Egyptian midwives wouldn't kill the babies. They were supposed to, if they were helping an Israelite woman have a baby and it was a girl, they could let it live. But it was, if it was a boy, they were supposed to kill it. Sounds like what we're doing now, killing them as they're being born. They refused to do it. This lady was going to have a baby at this time, and she had him. The Bible says when she saw that he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when it got to the place she couldn't hide him any longer, she built a little boat. King James says an ark of bulrushes. And lined it with mud and tar and put him in it and set him out on the river. His sister followed. And wouldn't you know it, the Pharaoh's daughter that had access to everything was down at the muddy Nile taking a bath. And just at the right time, Moses, I believe, cried, drew attention to the basket, and she went and sent somebody to get it and brought it, and she kept the child. And Miriam, the sister, said, Hey, would you like me to get somebody to take care of that baby for you and feed him for you? They didn't, you couldn't run down to Walmart and get a jar of baby food or formula. Yeah, that'd be great. Go get her and bring her here and I'll even pay her for taking care of her, taking care of the baby. And so she took him and took him back to her house and raised her own son and brought him to Pharaoh's house for him to be live and could have ruled in Pharaoh's house. Hebrews 11 tells us by faith, Moses when he was born was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So what happened to Moses? Well, Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 well let me back up and say this all of Hebrews 11 but let me just throw this in here Jockey Bad didn't wake up one morning and say I don't know what I'm going to do how am I going to take care of this kid what am I going to do with him Hebrews 11 says by faith they believed God and therefore they hid the child it's that's what the reason I love Hebrews so much it tells us Everything in the Old Testament, sometimes we read the Old Testament, we think, well, them people was just wandering around and they just happened up on stuff like that. You know, Abel just happened to offer the right sacrifice and Cain offered the wrong one. No, by faith, Cain, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. By faith, Enoch walked with God. By faith, Noah built an ark. All of that happened because they believed God. They weren't just people wandering around out there that happened up on God. They believed God. And so they hid him. Moses' mother, as I said, even got to be his nurse. And then, what happened to Moses? By faith, again, Moses, even though he lived in Pharaoh's house, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season esteeming the reproach of Christ. You get that? Moses, back in the Old Testament in Egypt, he counted the 
reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea, as by dry land, which the Egyptians, assaying to do, were drowned. Because of what Moses' mother, much like Timothy and much like Samuel, had placed in their heart, they kept going. And I love this verse. This would be this would be something to have. This has been a long time ago. I preached a sermon based on a commercial. What do you want on your tombstone? Anybody remember that? What if you had this on your tombstone? And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. How would that be for your marker? Moses is even considered a forerunner of sorts for Christ. Moses says in Deuteronomy 18, The Lord will send another prophet just like me. Peter and Stephen, both in Acts, say that that's who Jesus was. And when Jesus fed the 5,000, the multitude said, Isn't this that prophet that was supposed to come? Men of faith who accomplished great things who were influenced who were given the faith of their mother, Timothy's case his grandmother and they kept going they persevered they endured Paul could remember Timothy's sincere faith and the source of his faith and he could rejoice over the steadfastness of Timothy's faith. G. Campbell Morgan was a preacher in England, an evangelist. He had four sons and all of them were preachers. Someone came to their house one day and one of his sons' name was Howard and they asked Howard trying to see what kind of answer he would give. Howard, who's the greatest preacher in the family? Remember the daddy and all four boys are preachers. Who's the greatest preacher in the family? Howard looked at his father and said, Mother is the greatest preacher in the family. What a privilege mothers have. What a responsibility mothers have to share the faith. I told you I was going to... Uh, tell you a little more about your pens that I gave you. Those are imperfect pens. They're not only imperfect pens, they're unique pens. I made a bunch of them. Daniel made several of them. And we turned them on a lathe. They're None of them is exactly the same size. I'll comfort you with this, hopefully, and not. Some of them are a little wider than others. <laughs> some of them a little thinner than others. Some of them, the finish is not quite right. One of them, I don't know if I, hopefully I still got this one. One of them, I pushed the insert a little too far down in it, and it you retract it, the top of the pen just barely will stick out. So maybe for ladies it won't matter, but if you stuck it in your shirt pocket, it might make a little spot on your shirt. They're all different. As mothers, you can be like Eunice and Lois. You can be like Hannah and Jochebed. And your children still have a choice. I'm not preaching this message to make you think if you'll just do what they did, your children will turn out perfect because they won't. They may not. Because the children don't turn out perfect because there's no perfect mothers 
and back there's no perfect people. And that's why we need a Savior. You think you can read that to us or tell it to us? Your poem? About the Holy Blues? Yeah. Where they could hear you. Wait and let Daniel cut you on. All of me is turned in gold. Nothing more beautiful to behold. With men in the forest way, it's little in the sun of the shade. It's like our church we go around, saying the truth, saying to spring up. So let's not single out our soul and see the bright and be the gold. It bars us when it tries to be worthy for a king, you see. We're just a group of imperfect saints. But together a picture the Lord's could paint. Amen. Amen. And so, there are no perfect mothers. There are no perfect Christians. They're no perfect children. And that's why Christ came to save the ungodly, Paul says in Romans. We're called to mothers, fathers, parents to share that faith with others that they may have a sincere and steadfast faith. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Lord, we thank, we're thankful that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are thankful for our mothers, those who showed the way, those who taught us, those who lived out their faith in front of us. We thank you for your gift of faith that mothers kindle in us. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us where we have failed to set that example, to be the person that you've called us to be. Help us, Lord, to follow you. And Lord, if there's one here today that doesn't know you as Savior, may today be the day that they would say yes to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have a decision that you need to make, would you come as we stand and sing?